Our guest speaker today, Chris Dilley, comes by an ask from Reverend G. Chris Dilley has served People's Food Co-op since 1998, first as a board member and as general manager for the past 19 years. He has helped bring the community together to create a new store, to recreate the, far the Kalamazoo Farmer's Market, and to implement anti-racism transformational efforts. He serves on the board of directors of ERACE, and Chris is married to the visionary leader behind Can Do Kalamazoo, Lucy Dilley. And together they have a kind, creative, super smart kid named Elliot. Welcome, Chris. We're delighted to have you here. I'm grateful to be joined by my visionary wife and super smart kid today here. It's awesome. Thanks, guys. And thanks for having me today. I'm uh, excited to be here to talk about what's going on at PFC and um, yeah, and some things that I think we get to do together in our community uh, in important ways. So um, my name is Chris and I'm the general manager at People's Food Co-op and uh, as Kimberly said, for 19 years uh, so far. And uh, it's actually, I'm leaving my position at the end of this year or early next year. So I'm making space for the next the next leadership for our community in that space and for myself as well to do what's next for me so uh, but today i'm excited to talk to you about the work that we do at pfc especially in the in the space of of equity and anti-racism and anti-oppression um, and it is a journey so pfc is a 52 year, year old business in the kalamazoo community started in 1970 as the project of students at wmu how many how many of you have been to our store before? Yeah, okay, great. Thanks. So you know our focus is on locally grown and produced foods. We sell the freshest produce, uh, over 40% of which comes from local farms throughout the year. We uh, sell grocery, dairy, meat, cheese, beer, wine, amazing house-made sandwiches, soups, baked goods, and hot meals. It's a team, a scrappy team of about 25 folks that work there and make that happen every day. Um, how many of you have been to the Kalamazoo Farmer's Market? Okay, yeah, great, thanks. So that's a PFC production too. We've been managing the market since 2013. We're really proud of the ways that we sustain our local community from far farm to fork. Our store property at 507 Harrison Street has very recently been designated through Kalamazoo Area Wild Ones efforts as a homegrown national park. One of many, many small plots across our community, our continent, and the world intentionally planted with plants native to the area that support pollinators. We've planted over 2,000 native grasses, flowering plants, shrubs, and trees on site. It's a three-quarter of an acre site, so it's not a big site. That's a lot of native plants. <clears throat> they come alive in April, and the New England asters are still blooming today, supporting for six months of the year and supporting supporting pollinators for six months of the year and supporting hope for over a decade since we moved into our new home. Just as humans have stripped the natural world that we inhabit of the amazing web of life that supports us all, so has white male dominant culture stripped people of color, women, LGBTQIA+, and people living with disabilities of access to power and resources that allow an, an abundant, fulfilling lifestyle. Over the past decade, PFC has undergone and continues to undergo an overdue transformation, confronting the myriad ways that we have been designed and operate that reinforce this misshaping of the human experience. Like with landscaping, it is really the incredible diversity of thinking, values, approaches to problem solving, and worldview that results in a robust, resilient web of community. As things get harder and harder in the face of climate change, anti-democratic movements, and social unrest, I believe that it is this diversity that will save us. On the one hand, it's just the right thing to do, to do right by everyone, to ensure unfettered access to power and resources, regardless of race, ability, and compliance with rigid definitions of gender and sexual identity. Historically, those outside of the dominant culture's defined boundaries of worthy 
have been disproportionately kept from accessing health care, education, employment, capital, and more. And in surprisingly plentiful cases have been outright and directly harmed or killed. This just won't do. On the other hand, this hobbling of large parts of our natural and human communities is very much done at our own peril. Like the delicate parts of the web of the natural world come together to make an incredibly resilient fabric that life itself depends on, so do we need all voices, minds, sensibilities, and cultures to be part of the problem solving and collective action that our species depends on for survival. I believe that hope for our future as a community and planet is predicated on collective problem solving, which can only be done if the fullness of every single person is invited fully and unequivocally into the circle. It is both the fact that it is the right thing to do and the reality that to make it through the challenges ahead, we must all bring ourselves fully that drives anti-racism and anti-oppression work at PFC. A little bit about the history of our work in anti-racism. PFC has been on an anti-racist journey uh, in earnest since 2011, starting with an introduction to systemic racism training hosted by ERACE, uh, that's Eliminating Racism and Claiming and Celebrating Equity is the full name of that organization, um, but it definitely goes by ERACE because that's a mouthful. Started with a training from ERACE, uh, training 10 of our staff uh, with, uh, just months before the opening of our new store on Harrison Street. <clears throat> Two things stood out to me during that training. One, racism isn't just about how individuals interact. It is also about how systems and organizations are designed inequitably to inequitably constrain access to resources. And two, there was no way PFC could achieve our goal to build and nourish a resilient community if we didn't integrate equity into our lens. It needed to happen. <clears throat> so fast forward 11 years later, and our collective understanding of racism, of our individual roles in it, and of the role the PFC can play in dismantling it, as well as our understanding of the incredible depth of the problem, have definitely grown. It's challenging. It's really hard work. It's hard to confront those things in ourselves and in our organizations. In that time, we sorry, that was loud. In that time, we have struggled to work <clears throat> training and caucusing into the daily weekly or monthly work of PFC while ensuring that the central work of grocery and farmers market operations were given all the necessarily time and effort, needed time and effort. At first, we sent four to six staff every three to six months to erase trainings. This was in 2011 and 2012. At the end of each training, there's a next steps portion in which each group determines what they will advocate for at their institution when they return to ensure the awareness of systemic racism grows. I always attend the next steps portion when PFC staff and board and community go. And in those early years, I watched as the next steps that were identified grew from a careful suggestion of maybe reading a book together and encouraging other staff members to come to the training to an indignant wondering why PFC hasn't already created something more, something deeper in this case, an anti-racism, anti-racist transformation team. Boom, we were there. There was collective, a collective sense of the importance of having to, to do something. So by the end of 2013, we'd gotten PFC board approval to spend the money to form a team and, the, and began the training of our initial team. We began to intentionally diversify our staff and board, stepping into tokenism, learning from it, making mistakes, trying to do better next time. The cultural shift was palpable. We became aware of how the PFC customer service culture of greeting everyone in the aisle could feel like surveillance to black folks who had lived their lives being followed and overserved in the aisle as a way to make sure they weren't stealing. Leadership became not just gender diverse, but also racially diverse. The conversations became richer and a lot more challenging. 
We implemented racial identity caucusing at PFC during that time, inviting anyone that worked on, served on the board or at PFC to be, take part. We still do, do this today a couple times a year. We split into groups of white folks and people of color and discuss the same question in each group. In what ways does how we've all internalized the racist norms of our society show up in the work we do at PFC? From customer service to interactions with each other and leadership and so on. These conversations were and are rich and difficult. We experienced a major pitfall when it began to feel like some, to some, and a growing number, like we were allowing our focus on race to result in gender oppression. And we didn't do enough to increase the understanding of intersectionality, how different social identities in one person or group result in overlapping discrimination. We were unable to reach a point where we could share a sense of humanity between race and gender groups in time to avoid a pretty big blow up. Within a year, our very diverse leadership team had become all white again. White supremacy had had a victory at PFC. Often, I felt like we were fighting a losing battle, looking to increase the diversity of our staff, board, and the owner shopper base, but making white shoppers, our bread and butter, as it were, uncomfortable in the process. In retail, if your shopper's uncomfortable, you're probably not coming back. In 2020, with the horrific killing of George Floyd, the broader cultural awareness of racism shifted greatly. I think we all probably sensed that and felt that, and just the, the discourse in our communities just began to change. It's no, it no longer has felt like PFC was fighting alone. The broader white culture was fed up and ready to fight side by side. Finally, it felt like others were seeing what people of color had been experiencing for hundreds of years and what PFC had started to understand just a few years earlier. Our whole social and economic system was predicated on lower class of humans, whether based on race, gender, sexual identity, or ability. We were now kind of in the flow of a conversation that was, has been str getting stronger and stronger. Most recently at PFC, we have found ourselves on the front lines of our community's challenges with homelessness. And it's with this equity lens being so much stronger at PFC, it's so much easier to see what's happening there and how, again, we're creating these divisions between us that set us up for some people to have access and other people to not. We're located adjacent to several acres of undeveloped land, a great place to put up a tent or an encampment and within two blocks of both ministry with community and the gospel mission, our community's most used services if you're living on the streets. We have to put our focus on equity to work hard during these few years, attempting to find a path that both humanizes the community that surrounds us and respects healthy boundaries for our staff and community coming to work and shop every day. This work that I'm talking about and that I think we're all engaged in is not, it's not a task. It's not a thing you just like check off and you're done. Like, good, we're doing that now. Put up our, put up our sign and we, you know, we, we, we've adjusted a couple of key policies or things like that. Like, it's, it's truly a journey and actually it's more accurately described, I think, as a transformation. I think that name of, that we've taken in the erase training world of, anti-racist transformation is really key. We can't unsee systemic injustice once we see it. And the more pockets and patches of gardens of equity work are joined into blocks and square miles, the more we move to truly addressing systemic issues and the better, and the better chance we have of that garden flourishing and sustaining everybody. To transform is to follow the path of self-realization, regardless of how much where we're going resembles where we are or where we have been. Thank you.